right, so we are going to start a sermon series called Game of Life. This is the first sermon series I've ever written. I wrote it, started it 10 years ago in my first ever Bible study class at, at uh, Nazarene Bible College. And it's one of those things that has just never gone away. And so it's time. I can keep it in a file and keep going back to it, or I can share what God did in my life for the last 10 years. And, and it's a simple premise. We have all of these areas of our life that are important. We're going to be talking about our financial life today, which, believe it or not, is a very important part of our lives. Amen? Take our financial life out of it, and where are we? Right? But we have these, these six parts of our lives that are so important. We have our love life, our social life, our financial life, our spiritual life, family life. We have these parts of our life that are so critical, and the Bible has so many things to say about them. They're, it's so rich and so clear and, and a lot of it isn't open to interpretation. It's just there. But then there's this other phenomenon around the world that you can't escape, and that is the love of sports, right? So the reason I call it Game of Life is I, I started studying like 10 different sports, and I went deep, guys. I, I learned more about cricket than I ever needed to know. If you love the sport of cricket, that means you can explain it to me and come do that. Because I studied it like a scholar, and then I tried to watch. I don't understand it. But I, I dug in deep, because what I wanted to do is find the nuances of these sports that I really didn't know anything about, and, and then dig deeper into these sports that I knew things about. And there are these correlations for how these sports and games work and function. And what I started noticing is, is there was this overlap that just made sense. This sport is like this part of our life, and the Bible can speak to both of those things. So I've tied a professional sport to a part of our life, and then we want to see what God says about it, okay? So for you sports fans, this is going to be a little bit entertaining. Maybe not this week, because I have chosen soccer as the sport for our financial life. And listen, I'm not going to teach you anything about soccer to make you love it. Hear me. I'm going to tell you why it lines up with our financial life and... God says about that. So will you go with me? All right, let's pray real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. And Lord, I just pray that, that hearts are open to receive your word. That, that hearing words like financial and money aren't things that close hearts and minds. Like just let us let, us let you work. Give, let us just give you the space to do the work. Don't, don't hear the words that I'm saying. Hear the words that God has put on my heart. Give people the ability to discern the difference between David's intentions and your will and word. Lord, I pray that your will and word is all that's heard today. I completely set myself aside. I completely set myself aside. And I welcome you into this place for your word to be heard today. In your son's name, amen. I normally pray that every morning, every Sunday morning, three times. This morning was so hectic, I only got two. I decided to add it. That's my prayer every morning. I don't want you to hear me. I want you to hear what the, what the Lord has put on my heart and what he has revealed to me. Right? So, I am a sports fan, mostly as a player. I have always been involved with one sport or game my entire life. I cannot remember a time where I didn't. And I remember the first time I got my feelings hurt on a baseball field. I was a very good baseball player, and I'm going to be as humble as I can with that. I was very good. I was drafted by the major leagues out of high school, and I signed a letter of intent to play with uh, Arizona State University in 1988, who went on to win the national championship in 1988 and 89, respectively. One of my best friends in high school was Robin Ventura. We played, we played baseball together. We played travel ball together. If you don't know who that is, he was a very decorated professional athlete, played most of his life with the Chicago White Sox. Ended his career with the Dodgers, so we haven't spoken in a while. Um, Robin Ventura is famous, and, and I'm going to show you this video when we get to the baseball portion. He's famous for one reason. His first major league at bat, he was facing Nolan Ryan, and Nolan Ryan hit him. And, and Robin had a very, very split second to make a decision, and he chose wrong and charged the mound. Nolan Ryan putting him in a headlock while he was charging full steam and then just repeatedly punching him is one of the first viral videos on YouTube. And until Robin started his managerial career, the Rangers would play that video every time he stepped up to the plate. 
And when he came home, oh, it was on. We loved Nolan Ryan. We, we went to his camps and stuff together as kids. So for him to charge the mound is ridiculous because you know they talked. They've been around each other for a while. We grew up in Southern California, and Nolan Ryan put a hurt on him, right? So that's the kind of baseball environment that I grew up in. And then um, I had this tragic moment. I had signed with ASU. I was drafted by the Cleveland Indians, and I was getting ready to go. And I was pitching a doubleheader. We were coming through the loser's bracket in the California State Finals, but we had to beat them twice. And I was scheduled to pitch the second game, so all we had to do was win the first game, and I would be pitching in the deciding game of the California State Championships. And for those of you who are baseball fans, I averaged between 94 and 96 on my fastball my sophomore year and hit over 100 my senior year. I had a cannon. I was trained by Nolan Ryan. I played baseball. Something very interesting happened in that game. We were playing in this little backwater town, field was awful. The mound was terrible. So the pitching mound, there's a rubber, and the, the pitcher puts his cleat against the rubber and pushes off of it. Typically, the, when you take the mound, the dirt is level with the rubber. This one had a hole. You could see the rubber all the way down. It was about a six-inch hole. So it really was an awful rubber. We couldn't do anything about it. First inning of that of the championship game, we I pitched the and the guy hit it right back at me. And I couldn't handle it. And it spun me around. So I was facing directly back. They taught us how to fall at the level that I was playing at. We took ballet and tumbling. Yes? No, I didn't wear a leotard. And no, I never wore toe shoes. But we knew how to fall. And the idea was to protect your assets, right? So for me, it was my arms. So I tucked them. And I hit the rubber. Right here, full force, shattered both my collarbones. In that moment, everything changed for me. ASU got the doctor's report and cut me before I even showed up. And uh, Cleveland didn't exercise my contract, but hung on to me. And the fastest I've thrown since then was about 84. So I became a closer with a lot of junk. And I went to school for two years, and I played for UCSP, and then I played for the single-A Indians for two years, and then I'm at Kendra, um, which was the best thing that could have ever happened because my baseball career was done. Sports matter to me. They always have. And for a lot of my life, I hung on to what could have been because eight of the nine starters of our competitive club team all played at the major league level. The only one that didn't was this guy. And, and I was the one that was supposed to. You can, that can build a lot of regret in your life if you're not careful. But for me, it started an amazing journey that got me to where I'm standing here in front of you right now. If I played for the Cleveland Indians, I wouldn't be here. I guarantee it. And I wouldn't have listened to what God was doing in my life because I would have been so self-absorbed with how awesome I was. Right? One thing uh, most professional athletes have in common, they know they're awesome. All of them. So I could really speak to baseball. But that, that's the moment. I wanted to share that as we jumped off because I want you to know how important sports are to me. Not because I want my team to win, but because it, being that level of an athlete molded my character. Being that level of an athlete exposed me to things that helped grow me and mature me and led to where I'm at now. So there's a lot of really great things, so I hang on to that part of it. It's important. Now, I'm a huge soccer fan. And... Um, I chose soccer for a financial life because soccer is a very detailed and intricate sport. I could talk to you for six hours on everything that happens that has nothing to do with a field. Yeah. I know, I'm not going to do it. Don't you have to say don't do it? <laughs> I might like it better when you're teaching. Um, no, I'm just kidding. She knows I'm kidding. And I'm not talking about the actual games. As a matter of fact, the actual games, most of you don't like soccer because you don't like watching the games. There's a couple of reasons, right? All the fake falls. The league I watch, you get kicked out of the game for fake ball. I love it. And it's boring, right? It's only boring because you don't understand it. I I'm telling you. But also, you don't know the stakes, right? So let me, let me share with you the stakes because this is why soccer is most like 
our financial life. There are two things in soccer that we don't understand as Americans because we, we hear the word free agency and we know what that means. We hear the word trade and we know what that means, right? They don't do it that way in soccer. They don't do it that way in European soccer. In European soccer, they have what's called the transfer market, which is an open market or a time where people can buy and sell players. This has nothing to do with their contracts and it has nothing to do with how much they get paid to play. This is strictly their value on the open market. Think of it as like a mini stock exchange for soccer players. So whatever that player is worth, that's what the other team's gonna have to pay, and that's if the player wants to go and if the team wants to let him go. I'll give you an example. Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo are two of the most famous soccer players ever. And even though they're getting old, they have release causes and clauses in their contract, which means if some soccer team wants to buy them, they start at $500 million. And soccer is in a place in Europe well, we're going to see that. Because Neymar, the, the, the diver that everybody knows in the World Cup that would fall if anybody got near him, recently sold for $221 million. That's how much one team paid another team just to employ him. And then they had to pay him. So the finances of soccer are way different than American sports. There's a lot more at stake. Because if you spend $220 million on a player, you better be getting some silverware to back that up. And this is the better part. There's so much pressure on the teams that when you watch soccer and you know what's on the line, it becomes a different sport. So here's what's on the line. In soccer, they use things like relegation and promotion. So what's the worst Major League Baseball team in history? Just your opinion's fine, too. Somebody name out a team. Huh? Okay, somebody else. Pirates were a dynasty in the 70s. They just won a couple of World Series. Dodgers are not. <laughs> Cleveland Indians are awful. They even made a movie about how awful they were, right? What if, a, what if a team like the Indians that would have a movie made for them because they're so terrible and never win and can't get fans out, what if when they lost year in and year out they got per, demoted and kicked out of the league? The Cleveland Indians would have to go become a triple-A team if they stayed that bad. You see, that's, that's not what we have here. Teams can just be bad and make money. The worst teams make money. In NASCAR, they have this thing where people qualify. They only qualify, and then they only do a couple of laps, and then they park their car, and they collect their six- to seven-figure checks. So there's a brokenness in what matters in American sports, right? If... The Major League Baseballs, NFLs, and NBAs of the world told the teams, the bottom teams of every division get relegated to the minor leagues. And then the winning teams from the minor leagues for those divisions get to come up. How much more exciting would the, would the NFL season be? Because you have this race for the Super Bowl, but then this race for who gets kicked out of the league, right? That's exactly how soccer operates. Every game matters so much that if you're bad, you get demoted. And if you're good, you get promoted. So every player on the team has that. They're not just playing for wages or for entertainment. Because here's what happens. In the English Premier League, the lowest paid team in the league in the season, the last place team, will receive about $110 million just for being in the league in TV deals. The winner of the second division wins $25 million. It's a, there's $75 million at stake every time they take the field. For me, that made it the best sport in the world. We made it a blood sport, right? We love blood sport. All the movies are about fight to the death, right? So careers are ended when teams get relegated. If they don't have it in their contract that they can be released to go back up to the top tier, they now are off their national teams, they lose their advertising deals, everything. Every person on the club is affected by that. That's why soccer is like your financial life. See, I didn't talk to you about tactics or scores or teams. Our financial life is because it's intricate and it's detailed and it's hard to understand, but it matters. It's a blood sport. It's the one thing, practically, understand, I know you love your spouses and love is great and all that, but in the practical side of our lives, it is more important than everything else put together on the practical side. It's more important. Why is that? 
I don't know, rent, food, grocery, uh, utilities, fun, Netflix, right? But the cars, car parts. <clears throat> car parts. That's yours, man. You do you. The practical side of our lives, there is, there is more at stake with our financial life. And typically, our financial life is also the cause and source of a lot of things. So I'm doing this a little backwards. We're going to address the, the cause of what happens when we make the realization of how important it is, and then we try and, and deal with it, okay? And there are very gifted people in here. I'm not one of them. Um, I, I can tell you, I can give you a path on how to deal with yours, and I can give you a budget, and I can probably do it in a very quick amount of time, but me following it? different story. Work, I can handle work, that's different. My money, God knew what I needed. And not only is she beautiful and amazing and loves me, but she's gifted in that area. So she doesn't like me all the time for it. But that's what we have. We have this dynamic because that is so important. We have to have this dynamic, right? So the practical side of things is what we're focusing on. I don't want you to hear that I'm saying that your money is more important than your relationship with others or your relationship with God, because that's not what I'm saying. As a matter of fact, the opposite. I'm going to actually tie them together a little bit. Okay? So, if you'll open up your Bible, we're going to be in Luke chapter 12. This is a couple of passages um, that deal with the same thing, and you know the, the writer puts it in order of here's the thing, and then here's the, the effect of that thing. We're going to start with the effect. So we're going to start with verse 22. And we're going to, we're going to, I'm not going to read it all the way through. We're actually going to go through it. Um, I don't care if you retain anything that I just taught you about soccer. I'm not asking anybody to be a soccer fan, but I want you to understand that in soccer, everything matters. Every choice that we make, every reaction that we have as soccer fans and soccer clubs and soccer players, it matters financially. And that's exciting to me. So that's why I'm doing it. But I want you to understand that our personal financial lives matter. We face relegation, which is what they call it when you get demoted, or promotion. We face that in our lives with our financial decisions. So starting with verse 22. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, or what you will wear. Okay? First verse. This is not an invitation to not work out and eat McDonald's every meal. He's not telling you not to worry about it like you can do whatever you want. What he's telling you is, is he's given you the tools and, the, and everything, and you need to trust him that those tools work. And don't worry about it, okay? If anybody has never experienced food stress, then you're not going to understand what Jesus is saying. Be, to be a disciple and apostle of Jesus meant to leave everything and have faith that you were going to be provided for. These guys had food stress. They, they couldn't wait to get to the next village just so they could eat. This is, this is an area that doesn't get talked about a lot. The apostles had food stress. They had food anxiety. So it makes sense that Jesus is using food here as a provision. For life is more than food and the body more than clothes. We all know that. I don't have to dive in. Does anybody need me to dive into the truth that life is more than that stuff? It's part of life. For life is, or they, consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. I sat in a, a revival service and heard a preacher talk about how if you wanted to, to give everything up and go nomadic and become itinerant like Jesus was, to just roam around, that he would care for you like he cares for the crows. Stop it. What he's saying is, is God has made promises that he'll never let go of. And even in the midst of when we're dealing with something that feels like, where the heck are you, God? Right? Where the heck are you, God, is a common prayer. And it's a safe prayer. Just make sure you say heck. Okay? But it's a common prayer. I know this. I teach it. And yet, Thursday, I was here alone on my knees, saying, what the heck, God? What the heck? And it's always the same. I've got this. 
got this. He's saying that he, God cares more for us than the birds, and if God's going to care for the birds, why do we have to worry about it, right? Um, and how much more valuable are you than the birds? I just said that. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? That was a great question. Great question, right? Crystal and I, and Dasha and Lewis, we, we attended, and Kendra, and a bunch of us, um, attended a funeral yesterday in Hawthorne. And, and no matter who you are, if it's your family member, especially a close family member, there's a lot of worry, and there's a lot of anxiety, and there's a lot of stress. And I could say these words, worrying about stuff you have no control over. And my only hope is, is that it's comforting. But the truth is, is me telling you not to worry about something is not what you need to hear. Okay? And, and what Jesus isn't telling you is he's not telling you not to worry. Understand that he's, you hear the words, do not worry, but you've got to be able to put it together and put the whole thing together. It means you're worrying about stuff in a way that's making you remove me from the situation because you're trying to step in and be me in that situation. That's the difference in the worry. We, we are naturally going to worry. I, I have a, if you've been following our Facebook post, I have an uncle who's fighting for his life in Tennessee. And he's in Memphis. And the family's so spread out, he spends so much time alone. And the doctors can only talk to one person. So we've had a week where it's just like, what is going on? And we worry about that one person that can get to him because... It's too much. It's his youngest daughter. It's too much. So we worry and worry and worry and worry. And when we finally had a, a family conference call with, with the, the older members of the family, and we just said, look, we're all Christians on this phone. What are we doing? Daryl knows the Lord. And we're going to be destroyed if the Lord takes him. But we know the Lord. We need to trust. And we need to get as many people praying about it as we can. We were all preparing. We were looking at flights. We were rearranging our schedule. We were, we were there. And after that phone call and some prayer requests and some prayer, Daryl woke up and breathed on his own while we worried. And we didn't do anything. Our worry didn't do anything. We can't worry about the things that we have no control of. But more importantly, we can't worry because we don't have control. That's the worry we're talking about today. We can't worry because we don't have control. Because that's us wanting to wrestle with God and take things that aren't ours and try and run with them. And every time we do that, you might have a satisfactory result. But what did you do? You prove to yourself that you can play God and succeed. And you're taking credit for something that you probably didn't do. That's just the truth. So, when we worry because we don't have control, that's what Jesus is talking about. Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. The flowers don't worry about if they're going to be pretty. They just are, right? If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into a fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? right? We talk about faith all the time, and, and I'm not a finger-wagging pastor. I don't want to blame anything on anybody because I've made the same mistakes. What I hope is is that you can learn from people who have walked footpaths that you're walking, right? That's why we do this together. We do this together because together we are whole and complete, and apart we're missing stuff, Right? How many of you in here were drafted by a major league baseball team in, your, in high school? And how many of you have shattered your collarbones and lost all of that? I'm a unicorn in this room, right? For that, right? So if one of your kids ever does that, he gets an injury and loses their future, I've been there. Guess what? We're whole now. 
your life, your story, your path, your journey, your sin, your forgiveness from sin, your salvation, your discipleship, your fellowship, everything that you have done in your entire life matters because it's part of who we are. Part of what Jesus is saying here is quit making it about you. It's bigger than you. If a flower or a bird cannot make it about themselves and look, they're pretty awesome. Why do you toil and wrestle? Way easier said than done. Hear me, I'm, I'm not telling you I have this mastered. Far from it, okay? Far from it. If that is how God clothes... Oh, here we go. Sorry, I have to come back. And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after such things, and your Father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. So there's some pretty harsh language, right? So the pagan world is basically anything that's not the church, right? Pagan has a different meaning nowadays because there's pagan religions and pagan festivals. Look, whatever. What it means is the world tells you you got to worry about this stuff. And the world tells you that this stuff is important, right? The Super Bowl is in two weeks. It's an important day financially. I almost went with football because of all the finances around one game. It's incredible. People want to sell you stuff. And they know you're sitting right there, captive audience. So the best commercials, the funniest, the most entertaining, the most expensive ones, that's part of Super Bowl culture. The Super Bowl itself is just a game. But the Super Bowl experience is a business. It was close. And as we approach this day where people are controlling that, it's important for us to know they're trying to drag you into a place and make something more important to you than it really is. I'm hard to sell stuff to. I'm a salesman's worst nightmare. If you sell something, you got to want it, try it. Let's go. You'll be trained. Um, I don't like buying stuff. So let me wrap up here. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give it to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will, you will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. A lot of people know that one, and they like to say it because if this is important to me, that's where my heart's going to be, right? Money and sex are the two things that can take that, that away from God. And yes, if there's little kids in the room, I just said that word. I'm going to say it again. Money and sex. Those are the two things in the practical world that can dominate our control impulses. The number, the number one and number two causes of divorce in America, money and sex. Number one and number two. Number three is so far behind we don't even have to talk about it. Money and sex. It's important. God knows it's important. What Jesus isn't saying to you here is this isn't important. I'm not taking this value away from you. I'm not telling you to just be poor and homeless. No, not even for a second. But what he's also not saying is if you do the right thing, I'll make you better at what you are. Okay? What he's saying is, is you don't have to worry about this stuff. You're gifted, you're talented, you know what you're doing, and trust me. And I know what it's like to have the Titan belt. Okay? I know what it's like. I know what it's like to have to wait for your paycheck to know where you're putting your money. I've lived that life. And I've walked with people that have lived it. So I want you to know that I am not one of those pastors that's going to get up here and tell you to put your church first. Okay? Not. I'm one of those pastors that's going to tell you that when you trust God and you put him first you'll see a difference in your life. You won't see blessings. He won't double your tithe and give it back to you every month. It's not magic, and it's not a transaction. Giving is an act of worship that we do because of our, con our relationship with God and our trust in Him. And because we believe in the work of the kingdom. If your heart is not in a place, the Scripture very, very clearly tells us, do not bring me an offering that you do not completely believe is mine. If you're doing it just to please me or to show off or because you know you have to or you hope you're going to get something out of it, keep it. 
And most pastors are way too afraid to preach that message, but that's what the Bible says. How can I go against that just so I can get you to give the church more money? That's ridiculous to me. But instead, what it's about is our financial life is wrapped up into our spiritual life because it matters. Does the kingdom matter? Is my salvation that I receive because of what God did for the kingdom of God enough for me to make it matter? We at church, we use awful language to talk about money. And it's hidden, and I'm tired of it. I have to do a report every year that labels you guys under this awesome term called giving units. Love it, right? Chris and I are married, dual income house. We are one giving unit. I have to do that report. But you know what? It also, it, I, I don't care because we do have to do that stuff. But I'm, I'm tired of when we, think, when we make things icky and yucky and we don't, we're not transparent, then it all starts with trust. If you don't trust the church that you're a part of, or you don't trust the church, capital C church, because you've seen them do terrible things like telling them they need a brand new jet, so send me money. Or if you plant a seed of faith, you, you will grow it, so send your seed of faith in. We accept all major credit cards. Go to this website. Of course people are going to be skeptical of the church. That's why I'm always saying we need to be different, church. Our heart and our generosity needs to be wrapped up in our salvation and our trust and the truth in the kingdom. It needs to be a part of everything that we're doing. Whatever ministry your heart is sold out for, your generosity and your worship is part of that. But you can't get there if you're worried all the time. When you have to get your paycheck and decide where the money goes and you see that there's not enough, almost always the first thing that goes is your generosity. I know because I've been there. And I know because I'm human, and all of you are human, so unless there's not a human here, it is a thought you go through if you're in that position. If you're not in that position, you don't have that thought, that concern. It's true and it's real. And no church should ask you to eat ramen so we can get a new TV. No church should ask you to go without so we can have extra staff members. So that's not what I'm telling you. We need the generosity of the church to exist. We're fortunate we've been funded, but that's going to run out. But you can't get there if all you do is worry and stress. So I want you to hear that today. I talked about giving, but I didn't ask you to give. It's a heart thing. What I'm telling you is, is if you have that stress and pressure in your life, which if you're breathing in the room right now, you do. It might be different for every person. Some of you might be worried about where you put your extra income. Some of you might be worried about what that grocery list is going to look like or if i got to move in with somebody because I can't make it. We have everybody in between there. We're in this together. We're not a church that has financial resources that can bail somebody out. It might look like it, but we have an exact tight budget that is what it is. But what I'm saying is, is that as a group, nothing you're going through is something we can't handle, no matter what it is. It's not something we can't handle. And sometimes that might just be a shoulder to cry on, or an army of prayer, or it might be practical help. But if you want to start trusting God, start growing and maturing, which is what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying, I know this is hard. Jesus is saying, I know this is impossible for you. But together it's not impossible. God shows himself with the people that are in this room. We need to start being a church that's a church. And it starts with us, right? And it'll expand and go places you've never imagined. Do not worry, little flock. I love those words. Do not worry, little flock. Because we got you. We got you. Amen? Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we're just so blessed to be in your presence today. And Lord, I just pray that, that we are that church that shows the world what church is. That it's us. We love you and we love each other so much 
that we do not walk through fire ever alone, ever alone. Thank you for that truth. I thank you for the people that have, have lifted me up when I've needed it. And I thank you for, for just the blessing of being with people and experiencing these moments with them. Lord, we lift up. I, I, I received so many prayer requests today. We lift them all up to you now as a church, knowing you hear it. And we trust you. And it's your will, not ours. And I pray that every, every heart that leaves here today says those words as we navigate life. We thank you in your son's name. Amen. Amen.